Good morning. First of all, let me do something. Uh, it's becoming kind of a tradition. <laughs> Can you say hi? Three, two, one. Hi. Hello. Oh, it's, I'm filming myself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Now. Hi. Cool. Thank you. Hopefully this thing will not crash and I'll have to record again. Yeah, it did crash. Okay, never mind. Okay, thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, I really like to talk about this because uh, it touches like some of the very fundamental building blocks of the framework. And as a UI engineer, I think if you're doing any UI work, I think it's really important to have a very good understanding of like how the, the basic things of the framework works. Uh, so before I start, just like, um, yeah, I'm Lucas, I'm Brazilian, and I've been in Europe for uh, about eight years, and I've been doing UI for a bit longer than that, actually, about like 10 years. So I'll start by telling a bit about my trajectory as a UI engineer, because that touches a bit of the, the main topics that I want to cover today. Because a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the trajectory of Android as a platform, or more specifically, as a UI platform, follows a very common pattern on UI toolkits in general. So in many ways, this talk will cover the specifics of Android, but a lot of these techniques and a lot of the way layout works on Android is applicable to uh, pretty much any toolkit you can think of, uh, any modern toolkit, uh, anyway. Um, so uh, do you know what this is? Yeah? Has anyone used this? Is anyone like here like old enough? To <laughs> cool, one, okay. So this is GNOME 1.4. That's the first thing I worked on as an open source contributor back in the day, 2001 or something. And this is like very, like back then we were trying to attack the Windows market uh, share and try to provide an open uh, alternative. Like, and I've been like in the GNOME project since kind of the early days until this GNOME 2, which was much cooler actually. Uh, and one cool thing about, like, in terms of the UI toolkit story here is uh, G the GTK, the kind of the, the UI toolkit that is the basis for everything you do on GNOME, uh, was created as an alternative to Motif. Has anyone used Motif here? Ooh, cool. Like, uh, okay. So, uh, and GTK was something that arose from the GIMP project, the graphical tool, like, if you use Linux, you probably know about this. And I think it's cross-platform, but uh, mostly used on Linux. Uh, and GTK was evolving as the desktop uh, platform evolved with it. So G GTK2 was much ad more advanced than GTK1 in many ways. It was mostly an API cleanup, but it still like, was pretty uh, a, a big step forward uh, in relation to the, to the version one. Then I started doing more GTK stuff at Nokia. And that was in the very beginnings of like the more modern devices that we know today. Has any, does anyone know what this is? Okay, cool. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is a Maemo based uh, device. It was like this Linux based platform that Nokia was trying to do uh, to push for like back in 2006 or so. Uh, so that was my first like uh, experience with like mobile development and but it was still very desktop-like in many ways. Um, and this was, this was really fun. This is like um, golden ages of Nokia doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of open source Linux people got hired. So it was like a dream job for someone who was working on, on Linux back, back then. Uh, then I, I started working on something called um, the webbook, it's this thing. So it was basically still like a, uh, a bunch of like GNOME hackers who got together to basically develop a new OS. And this was my first experience with like a very motion-driven uh, kind of UI. And, and for those who track like GNOME stuff, like Lil was the creator of like the JS bindings for that is like what runs GNOME 3 nowadays. So that was the first GJS thing back, back then. 
So it was pretty fun. Then I got into Android development, and that's when I like, started doing Android stuff uh, full time. So I've, I assume you maybe you've heard of like the, this little app uh, called Pattern. It's a little wallpaper app that got like got featured quite a few times uh, in the App Store, and and then Firefox for Android. And now Facebook, which is mysterious because I can't disclose what I'm working on <laughs> yet, but hopefully soon. Um, cool. So throughout all these phases, um, one thing that I realized, and going like through like different like APIs and platforms and frameworks, like the thing that is like became very clear to me is like if you assume that you know how the toolkit works. Uh, you probably be shooting uh, yourself in the foot like all the time because yeah, you're probably assuming wrong things most of the time. And we're lucky that like Android is an open source platform and we can see how things work. And I think this is extremely valuable as a new engineer because you can track how what actually is happening behind the scenes when you do fundamental things like request layout calls and su and such. So. Uh, a biggest, the biggest reason why I'm, I, I do this talk is I think we need to be more deliberate about our UI code uh, to get the most out of the platform. Uh, and that's what I'll be covering today. So in many ways, this is a talk about the basics of Android. But instead of talking about the API from a user perspective, a user of the platform perspective. I'll be doing something from inside out. So I'll be taking the basics and talking about how it works from under the hood. So the architecture of UI toolkits, uh, uh, pretty much any UI toolkit you can think of, like uh, from desktop to mobile, I think the, the biggest change that happened like in the last 10 years with UI toolkits is that motion became a very central piece of like the architecture. and the interactions moved from mouse and keyboard to touch. Uh, but other than that, the architecture is pretty much the same. You, have all, you always have something of a layout notion that defines size and position of everything. You have a notion of rendering. You paint things on screen. And you have a notion of like interacting with these elements and changing their state through touch or key events and, and such. So. The old school, and that's my framing, by the way. There's nothing, this is nothing academic. It's just the way I, I frame the history of UI toolkits uh, in general. Uh, when you talk about the old school stuff, the GTK 1s and 2s, uh, and the motifs and the uh, TCLTKs, uh, like the, the very old school stuff, uh, it was basically this notion that you nest boxes in boxes and you pretty much focus a lot on layout and the rudimentary in, with a very rudimentary notion of motion. Uh, so if you look at the how these like uh, UI toolkits got implemented, they were all assuming a static layout for the most part. And if there was a motion, it's kind of like a bonus, and it was super hacky and clunky. Um, so and funny enough, like Android. At, is actually kind of like behind the curve in terms of what is considered a modern. Uh, it, it was behind the curve uh, when it comes to like modern toolkit architecture until Jellybean. So Project Butter, which sounded like a really cool like bleeding edge kind of thing, was something that like many toolkits had for years. Uh, so the notion that like like the whole notion of like synchronizing everything uh, with refresh rate was like not new at all. Uh, so Jelly Bean was kind of like Android catching up with like what is considered a modern UI toolkit in many ways. So if you look at like how Jelly Bean or pre-Jelly Bean Android was implemented, you had this notion of like it was basically a handler with a looper and you would just post stuff whenever you want to relay out the UI. And this is why you get like you got a lot of like inconsistent behavior with animations and the anim animations AP the animation APIs until uh, Honeycomb were very rudimentary. So Android caught up, like, I think it's pretty much a modern toolkit uh, nowadays, but it took longer than, like, most of the players in the, in the same space. So if you think about, like, a, what is a modern UI toolkit, is, uh, is the way I define is to a UI toolkit that has a very predict 
predictable notion of time and pace. So everything that happens in terms of input, layout, and motion, and especially motion, because one of the main drivers of like the new architecture is that you can do motion and it's consistent and reliable and it always behaves the same way unless you're doing something really wrong with your UI code. Uh, but modern toolkits have a tick. And the way this tick is defined is usually from the refresh rate of the device. So the thing that we talk about, if you look at the, like, the most of the devices uh, in the market today, they, they basically have like, a range, they range from like 58 to 60 uh, megahertz like, of refresh rate. And that is where the 60 frames per second comes from. Uh, uh, the frames of having 16-ish uh, milliseconds comes from the refresh rate of the target devices that we're working with uh, nowadays. So, and modern toolkits like use that as a reference, and there's a reason for that. One, you, want, you don't want to do more than you need. So you don't want to do uh, refresh more than the, 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 the device can do because you'll be wasting uh, battery and a bunch of like, resources on the device. And you don't want to do, you, go, you refresh the content of UI halfway, the tearing problems, uh, if you have like half of your screen in one state and the other half in another. So the sync has this, is basically what orchestrates all the updates in the UI. So in Android terms, the architecture, the overall architecture is like driven by something called choreographer uh, that was introduced in Jelly Bean. And the, the notion that, the, the, the overall notion that of frames is a very core cool, uh, aspect of, the, of this architecture. So you have frames, and every time you need to change something, every time that you interact with the UI, you queue an update in the next frame. And that's a very important thing to frame any questions, any, any work you're doing in the UI. Uh, it's pretty much about queuing stuff in the next frame. That's the fundamental building block of everything you, we do on Android nowadays, modern Android. So if you look at the choreographer.java code, you have something like it hooks into the, in the vsync uh, events, and every time a new frame is called from vsync, like, it will check if there's any pending work. And there's one important aspect here in terms of the order of these calls, because this is a very, important aspect in terms of framing questions about UI too. You always handle input first, because that will probably invalidate and request layout in your state. Then you handle animations, will, which again will probably call uh, uh, triggering validations in your uh, view hierarchy. And then you do the traversal, which will probably uh, mean in practice redrawing or in, uh, in case of layout changes, uh, a layout traversal. So, Another core component of Android is view root impl, which is uh, it's not a public API, but it's the thing that sits at the top of your view hierarchy. So your, your root view or the root view of the activity is, is not actually the root of your view hierarchy. View root impl is the thing that sits on the top of everything, and it, will un it understands how to update like, the UI from top down and bottom up in, in some ways. Uh, especially for, for touch event handling. And that's the piece of the platform that interacts with the Surface Flinger to compose the new state uh, of your app with the state of the system UI, like w which means status bar, navigation bar, and so forth. Uh, and the notion of, of, uh, of views in, in, in Android is driven mostly from uh, this root, view root impl. So, again, like, so from, from a user perspective, uh, what we have is these three steps. I think, like, I, I will assume that everyone is, is aware of these three steps that each view has to go through. So you always measure, which means figure out the size of things, uh, layout, commit the size to a certain position, and draw, which means collecting operations to render this thing once, uh, once the, the vsync uh, event happens. So let's have a look at like, how this is done. And I'll try to go through this uh, step by step and like, highlighting some aspects of the framework which I consider interesting for, for today. So uh, you measure, uh, and that's when you call like, measure and unmeasure. Uh, in a view, and this is a recursive operation, like traversal is a, uh, is a recursive operation throughout the whole tree. Uh, 
And then there's something called lazy measure, like which I'll just briefly mention today, but uh, it's this notion that like you cache the pair of like measure specs and you make sure that like you don't remeasure things when you don't need to. So uh, before KitKat, when you had multi-pass layouts, like things with layout weights and relative layouts and stuff like that, uh, you would cache the last measurement uh, from the view. But if you, go, if you went through measurement again in the same cycle, it would miss the cache and call a lot of measurements in the, in the same layout traversal. So la lazy measure basically uh, caches the, the, all the pairs of measure specs used in the same traversal. And whenever layout is called, it will check if measure is, has been postponed to the layout, and it will call all measure only once. So this is actually, I predict that Google will be doing a lot of work in terms of like optimizing layout traversals on the measurement, measurement spec, uh, aspect. Uh, mostly around text, for example. Like text is very expensive to measure, and you don't want to measure things all the time. And multi-pass layouts at the top of like top level views is, it can be very expensive too. So this is probably going to be a focus in terms of performance. Uh, the next step is layout, which is positioning things at, uh, at their position. And in the framework terms, layout and on layout. And that's pretty much when you commit left top, uh, right button to your to reviews. That's uh, the simple one. And then draw, which calls, again, follows the same pattern, draw and on draw, which in in the hardware accelerated world means updating this playlist. Like, is everyone familiar with the notion of this playlist? Like, who's not uh, familiar with this playlist? Okay, cool. Uh, so this playlist, like, uh, it's, it's something that is not obvious, like, from just looking at the API, but, like, the notion of draw on Android is not that you're actually executing drawing commands uh, synchronously on your draw calls. Like, what Android does, actually, is when you implement a, an on-draw method with the Canvas API, what Canvas is essentially doing is collecting all your, all your commands and storing that in a list. So every time you invalidate something, you're basically uh, recreating the list of commands. And then these commands will be pushed to, uh, to the GPU later at like, a convenient time for the framework. Uh, so, uh, so whenever you invalidate something, um, what you're essentially doing is asking the, the framework to recreate the display list. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. So, but the, the bottom line here, and that's pretty much the takeaway I want from this, is understanding invariants of the UI toolkit. And invariants are layout when you run layout, you definitely measured everything already. And if you're drawing something, you definitely have positions and sizes committed to all the views already. So if you have that in mind, you won't hand wave when like, oh, why is the width of this thing not defined? You probably didn't measure yet. Uh, and if you're doing this in an arbitrary piece of the code that doesn't assume that like, that doesn't like, hook into the, the UI toolkit in the right place, you'll be in a bad situation. So a few code smells for UI toolkit. If you're doing get measure width, get measure height, outside layout, uh, you're probably doing something wrong. Uh, so if you want to do it uh, in the proper way, you're probably hooking into the, the tree observer callbacks and waiting for layout and doing things more deliberately. Uh, allocations, in the same way, if you're doing allocations on layout, that's probably okay-ish, because layout is not called many times during traversal. If you're doing uh, allocations in on measure, you should probably try to avoid it as much as possible. In on draw, like, just don't. Like, never allocate anything on on draw. Because on draw is called in each frame in an animation, for example. So you'd be allocating a lot of objects. So, like, that's kind of like a very general guideline for allocations. So uh, things get more interesting when you change things. So I, I just described, OK, you have something on screen. So what happens 
when you want to change things. So the first notion is, that we're probably familiar with, is like the notion of request layout, right? Uh, so uh, what does request layout actually do? Uh, is to bubble up your lay layout request up to the root, the root impl, like the purple box there. And what, uh, and one important aspect here that I want to highlight is this is one of the reasons why having deep trees, view hierarchy trees, is expensive. Because you have to go all the way up uh, every time you call it. So this is a very visual representation of why this could be expensive. So in terms of like layout view uh, .java code, uh, if you look at request layout, it will just check the parent. Did I request layout yet? Yes. Uh, if not, then I do. Uh, a request layout on a parent, and that bubbles up onto like the root of the, your view hierarchy. And in terms of like view root impl, whenever this request layout reaches the top of your view hierarchy, it will queue a traversal to the, in the next frame. So, and that means that if you call request layout like a hundred times in the same frame, you will not do a hundred layout traversals. You will just do one in the next frame. But you will do bubbling up things up to the root in each call. So you should avoid uh, calling it too often. Invalidation is when you want to redraw something. And as I mentioned, in the display list based world, this means recreate my display list. Um, and in complex views, and this is why the recommendation is to usually use uh, hardware layers for, for complex views, is because you want to avoid recreating display lists in each frame. So in terms of like code, invalidation adds a flag to invalidate the view. And then when the draw call uh, is triggered in the next frame, you be basically checking that and recreating the display list. And one important thing here is uh, invalidation uh, is not something that invalidates the path up to the root. It just invalidates the thing that you call invalidate on. So it's not like request layout that invalidates the path in the tree up to the root. OK. So and last but not least, when you're doing animations, the post on animation and your object animators, what they're essentially doing is queuing a callback in the next frame. So just as a reminder, it's this thing here. So it's the callback animation. And like another piece of like information that is very important when you're framing your UI questions is, so if I'm running an animation, I know that I handled input already. So if you have something that deals with animations and input, the order is guaranteed. This is an invariant of the framework. So you can rely on the fact that input is handled whenever you're running your, input, your animation callbacks. But you're not, you haven't run the traversal yet. Uh, I briefly mentioned Tree Observer because I think it's a API, an API that is not used as often as I would expect. Uh, and if you want to be deliberate about when to call things when the size is defined, on pre-draw listener is probably the right way to do it. Uh, it's a bit more verbose than like uh, alternatives, but like that's the deliberate like the deliberate kind of API that you should be using when you want to check for uh, guarantee that the size of things is defined. Um, and one interesting piece uh, I wrote a bit about that like. Uh, I'll post the slides later, but like uh, the this blog post explains how the transitions framework works, and it's heavily uh, reliant on this API. So the way the transitions framework that got introduced in trans uh, in KitKat relies on something that follows this pattern, and this is a pattern that you can use yourself without the transitions uh, framework, by the way, where you save the state of your views, which means translation. Uh, sizes and and so forth. Then you wait for the next frame to be laid out, and you're about to draw, and then you restore the state and animate the difference. That's essentially how the transitions framework works, and that in on the same token, how the activity transitions work and all that. This is a very simple pattern that you can use if you want to do. Uh, funky layout transitions uh, by hand. And I'm not suggesting that you should do it, but again, the idea, uh, my, my point here is understand the basics so you have the power to deviate from what the framework offers whenever you need it, and you should be confident about that. <laughs> 
So basic tips, never do layout in layout. Like this is bad, like this is the worst ever. So if you're doing something on, in the, your layout uh, implementation and you call request layout there, what will happen is that at the end of the full traversal of the tree, it will check, did anyone request layout? Yes then I'll do the, the traversal all over again in the same frame. So you're probably skipping frames if you're doing this in animations. Uh, the second is no layouts, no layout traversals in animations. So never change size or anything like that uh, manually. The transitions framework has private APIs to do size transitions uh, efficiently, but with public APIs, you can't do that. So you don't want to traverse the whole tree in each frame. This will probably not do uh, 60 frames per second at all. So let's not do that. Uh, and invalidate regions if you can. Uh, if you're, instead of invalidating the whole view, try to figure out what part of the view got invalidated so that you're giving enough context to the framework to figure out like, what views need to be redrawn and the display list that need to be recreated. Uh, and from understanding the basics, I think it becomes a lot more obvious like why simplifying view hierarchy is, um, is a good thing. Because you avoid a lot of like traversing the tree back and forth. If you have a deep tree, this would be more expensive. So simplifying view tree is about making these basic operations more efficient. And avoid multipass layout like layout weight and rel relative layout, especially at the high level, like top level of your tree because this will cause multi-measurement in, in the whole UI, basically, if you have that like there. At like, the, like down in leave, uh, the leaves of your tree, that's probably less expensive because you're just dealing with a couple of views in there. So list views and stuff, that's not like hugely expensive. And if you want to know more about custom views, uh, a good way to simplify a view hierarchy is to implement custom like layouts. And I know it sounds kind of scary at first, but if you understand the basics again, and if, if you know a couple of like APIs, you can do a lot by basically hard coding your layout because you know what you want instead of using these general purpose things that can be very expensive. So. Uh, I wrote a bit about that. Like, if you if you want to know more about like the different techniques you can use to vi to write the custom layouts and custom views, have a look at this blog post. And flattening things is great, but like you have to be careful. So if you're doing a lot of custom drawing, uh, that means you're not relying on the view framework anymore. So make sure that like if you go flat, you're accounting for the drawbacks of that. So just to give you an example, if you're drawing text manually with like a Canvas API, you lose accessibility, you lose keyboard navigation, you lose all these things. So if you're doing like custom stuff, uh, make sure that you're like doing this deliberately and, and accounting for the, the kind of compromises you have to make. Cool. Um, we're doing some really deep stuff with layout at Facebook uh, in a couple of projects in London. So if you are interested in this kind of like crazy stuff, uh, that should be a pretty fun place to be. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you.